Uh, hi, um, I'm. Uh, my name is uh, Brendan Fote. I'm assistant editor at the uh, journal The New Atlantis. I'm talking today with George Church, who is professor of genetics at Harvard University. And we'll be talking a bit about some of the recent developments in genetic technology and maybe some of their ethical implications as well. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, so the first thing I uh, wanted to sort of talk about was a project that you're involved in, Dr. Church, the, uh, the Human Genome Right Project. Uh, this is a project that is, uh, goes beyond some of the things that have been done with uh, DNA and the sort of like linguistic metaphor of DNA of reading it and editing it, but actually writing whole genomes, synthesizing them all together. Uh, could you maybe just explain a bit about what this project is, how it would work, why it's being uh, uh, done? Right, so uh, it's primarily a technology development cost reduction project um, with some immediate applications, some longer term, and then some applications we haven't thought of. Just like the previous genome project, the Genome Project READ, uh, which I was involved in starting in 1984, um, we hope this one will be much more uh, uh, cost effective that will bring the price down sooner and it and both reading and writing are on exponentials where the cost of sort of raw reading and writing is is on the order of maybe thousands of dollars small numbers of thousands of dollars per human genome equivalent uh, let's just use as a milestone it doesn't mean that we're focusing entirely on human genomics but it's just a uh, it's a way of saying where we stand right now in terms of cost uh, then applications, one of my favorites is, uh, is uh, understanding variants of unknown significance, and uh, which might be of diagnostic and therapeutic significance, but also uh, making virus-resistant cells. That's something that's truly kind of genome scale synthesis that's been partially proven now in, uh, in microbial species. So maybe say a bit more about um, the viral resistance. Uh, what uh, kinds of changes would be made to a, a genome or to a chromosome to make it virus resistant? So you can make uh, virus resistance sort of one virus, one gene at a time by knocking out viral receptors or making um, uh, CRISPR that might attack the viral genome. Uh, but there's a way that we've worked out uh, <clears throat> in E. coli where you can uh, change the genetic code, meaning changing every time that every that certain codons are used, these triplet ACGs, Ts, uh, that code for proteins, if you change every instance of that throughout the genome, you can alter it uh, in such a way that a virus can't adapt to it. Uh, and not just a virus, but all viruses simultaneously. So this is a really profoundly different strategy for uh, fighting viruses that might be available for industrial cell culture, whether it's microbial or uh, mammalian or plant cell culture, and then plants and animals and agriculture as well, and human cells in therapeutic settings. In terms of the therapeutic set settings, would that be in terms of, say, a cell therapy for a patient affected by a disease, or would this potentially be something you'd think of in terms of reproductive applications, making maybe a whole person with these synthetic genomes? Uh, you know, I think that, that you know the, the least speculative is using it in industrial uh, production of vaccines and, and, and proteins. So human cells or mammalian cells in culture, it's already used routinely in, uh, in industrial settings. Uh, then less speculative would be agricultural. And then, and then finally, uh, in a clinical setting, I would think it would be stem cell therapies, tissue therapies, uh, maybe organ transplants. And by the time all of that's been tested, then um, probably long before then, uh, we'll be dealing with even the smallest change, single base pair change in the human germline. Right now, that's, uh, that, that remains, the, the application of that remains to be fully articulated and the, the ethical and uh, FDA approval process remains to be specified, even for one base pair, much less a uh, whole genome. Sure, of course. Uh, one other thing about the sort of genome writing project that uh, that interests me, you, you mentioned that it's sort of improved in principle for bacterial genomes, uh, which are relatively simple compared to eukaryotic genomes in terms of the stuff that's packaged around the DNA. Um, 
in a human genome, for instance, there's all kinds of proteins, histones uh, that sort of arrange the chromosome and the DNA. Uh, is this part of the synthetic genome project uh, for like a human genome right project? Are there efforts to, you know, discover all these different histones and how to package the DNA in addition to simply sequencing it or uh, synthesizing it? Well, I should I should point out that that uh, the whole the whole genome scale synthesis, whole chromosome scale synthesis, has been tested in yeast, which is a eukarya. Uh, it uh, Furthermore, many parts of it have been tested in uh, in, anim in animals, uh, so we can make not only animal cells, but full uh, developmentally uh, competent animals have been edited. The 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 proteins that package it uh, are not really a problem in any of these organisms. They, they there's a self assembly process which is very potent. You bring in a foreign DNA, uh, it goes to the correct place called homologous recombination or HR for short and when it go when it goes in it it starts getting uh, self assembling all the transcription factors activators inhibitors histones and so forth that are necessary for it uh, it's not always perfect but we're getting good both at the genetic engineering as well as the epigenetic engineering if that's needed but for the most part if you change the the gene if you correct or change uh, even a big change um, the, the cell has a way of coping with it. So this works for not just editing, but also for when you're inserting large Big, chunks of genes. Large chunks of DNA. The biggest that I know of is 10 million base pairs have been moved from human into mouse cells to make humanized mice. So not just mouse cells, but mice humanized so that they uh, will produce antibodies that are already human just immediately without having to go through an extra process. So that's 10 million base pairs uh, it's not fully synthetic, but it is certainly foreign, uh, and it's and in a way it's more extreme than some of the synthetic uh, projects would be. So I think we have plenty of precedent that we can change really huge chunks of DNA um, um, for 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 bit for, for 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 very practical purposes like uh, humanized antibodies. Sure. Uh, so moving on to a slightly different subject, uh, I'd really like to discuss a bit about de-extinction, which is another project that you've been involved in and written about a little bit. Um, it's a very obviously intriguing area of science, the subject of movies like Jurassic Park. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the kinds of technologies that might be used to bring extinct animals, plants perhaps, uh, back from extinction? Uh, what kinds of animals might be brought back? What kinds of technologies would be used? Right. So like many of these projects, we need uh, to both re be able to read ancient DNA and then write it again. Uh, we don't necessarily have to write everything from scratch, although it, it might be increasingly convenient to do so as the price drops exponentially. Um, uh, you know, there's a long list of, of uh, organisms that people find attractive either for pure charismatic reasons or for uh, their impact on uh, conservation of existing species or for conservation of environments uh, like the the woolly mammoth is my favorite of the long list uh, for many reasons one is uh, helping the Asian elephant as an endangered species by extending its range its its habitat to to the this huge uh, ecosystem uh, in the Arctic which is uh, very low and low very low po human population density so that would reduce uh, that particular conflict, and so not only is it advantageous to Asian elephant, but also potentially to the environment environment that we should care deeply about because as it melts, it releases a lot of carbon dioxide and methane, which are global warming gases, so much so that it's twice the carbon just by melting that you would get from burning all the forests of the world. So it's a really a very significant amount of carbon. And how might uh, uh, woolly mammoths being introduced to the, the tundra there prevent the release of these uh, uh, methane? Deposits? So there were two, two theoretical arguments that I know of that have turned into experimental. Uh, so uh, one is that in the summertime, it, it, it knocks over trees and, and, and uh, removes the dead grass so the grass can be the dominant, one of the dominant species and has high reflectance in the summer, reflects the, the warming sunlight. Uh, and then in winter, it punches through the, the deep uh, insulating layer of snow so the cold air can penetrate, and those two combined uh, 
um, now is experimentally been, de been determined by uh, mimicking the impact of an elephant mammoth um, and it results in a 20, this is done by the Zimov team in, in Siberia, uh, a 20 degree centigrade uh, observed difference in the, between the control and the experimental plots. Now, that, that may or may not be, you know, hold up, but uh, I think it will, and I think, you know, it's in the right direction. So it's yet another argument uh, in favor of uh, the extinction of this particular species. But more broadly, we're talking about conservation of species, um, conservation of the Asian elephant, just adapting it to a modern environment, which is extremely cold or, or extremely warm or, or um, dry or what have you. Right, a, a different environment than perhaps it existed when uh, uh, when the animal was uh, uh, originally or, or, existed, or, or a different environment from what exists today in their sure. in their current environment. <laughs> uh, so there's another. Um, there's obviously there's the idea of de-extincting extinct animals or endangered animals. One of the other uh, possibilities that you've raised before is the idea of bringing back some of our own close relatives, uh, certain hominins like the Neanderthal. Uh, which might be theoretically possible through certain synthetic bi biology techniques. Uh, is this something that th it's obviously more speculative? Is there really much interest in doing this kind of thing, bringing back a closely related hominin species? I, I, I think there's interest in testing hypotheses when you just just reading DNA is not uh, that uh, necessarily that informative. Uh, you need to test the ideas. But I think bringing back the, the species, uh, there haven't been as clearly articulated advantages as there have been for the elephant. And there's additional ethical uh, uh, boundaries. Uh, like I said earlier, even changing one base pair in the germline is some, is considered a, a requires exceptional uh, mo mo motivation and proof of safety and efficacy. Uh, I think the way that, that that the slippery slope could happen if you consider it positive or negative slippery slope would be we'll start with patients that have uh, let's say male infertility that can only be fixed what would normally be somatic gene therapy in this case would also affect their germline but in a very benign way where you basically you're not creating something new that's never been before you're just returning to the healthy fertile uh, form for their sperm stem cells and then it's a small step from that to curing diseases like Tay-Sachs, where you have two carrier parents who would have, uh, um, you know, very severely affected children, maybe 25% of them. If you alter the male germline, then you, uh, then you effectively make them no longer a carrier. I mentioned that only in the context of your question about uh, other types of humans is we need to get through, get through, get great confidence and comfort with these small uh, medically significant changes before we would even have an uh, informed conversation about more radical departures. But they could, they could be very informative about uh, uh, behavioral and neural diversity, uh, but there may be other approaches to that as well. Sure. Well, let's move on to, to gene editing and human reproduction that, to, now yeah. that you've raised that. That's obviously a yeah. much more near-to-hand controversial issue yeah. that's being discussed by lots of scientific bodies and ethical bodies around the world, especially in light of the recent experiments that were done in China and now are being done in Sweden and the United Kingdom involving the editing of human DNA in human embryos. Uh, and so far, these experiments have been done fully for basic research with no direct intention for transferring these embryos to a woman's uterus to bring them to term and to have a genetically modified uh, baby, a genetically modified child. Uh, but this is something that people are suggesting is perhaps down the road. It is, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned the idea of using uh, a male fertility treatment, modifying uh, the uh, male sperm cells rather than modifying human embryos. Because the modification of human embryos, it does seem difficult to see the clinical justification for that, given that when you're talking about modifying or treating a, a genetic condition, the most serious genetic conditions where you might have a clinical justification are these one single gene diseases that are passed on in usually one in four children uh, of, of parents who carry recessive genes. Uh, 
so for these cases, we already have for the past two decades, we've had techniques like pre-implantation genetic diagnosis where embryos that are affected by the disease are discarded and embryos that are not affected are implanted. In this way, parents who want to have children but are concerned about the prospect of these diseases can safely do so. Um, one counter argument to that that some people have raised is that parents who are concerned about the idea of selectively killing their embryos if they have a certain perspective on the uh, sanctity of, of embryonic life might be concerned about using these technologies like pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. But it's still a little bit difficult to see the justification for editing embryos since there's almost always going to be some form of selection anyway, given how IVF works. So it's interesting that you bring up the idea of modifying the sperm cells in men rather than modifying the embryos, since this might circumvent that. But aren't there also concerns in terms of modifying the uh, uh, sperm cells uh, uh, of men? Would there not still be a some uncertainty about whether the genetic modification of the stem cells you've implanted in the male patient um, have actually contributed to all of the sperm cells that they're producing? Um, it seems like that would be a fairly uncertain process that people wouldn't have that kind of reliability to rely on just that and not also, say, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis of the embryos? Uh, well, right. I, mean, I think in the case of male infertility, which will be the first case, um, they won't be contributing to the, germ the, to the embryo uh, unless they're edited because the phenotype is infertility. Oh, um, sure. So I, I so I think that that will be the first uh, case, and it will and uh, and there really is no PGD PGS pre genetic pre implantation genetic screening that can be done. Um, I think that when you get uh, when you when you want to uh, move, assuming that gets accepted, that's safe and effective for infertility. If you want to move to something like say Tay Sachs disease, very severe, uh, impactful diseases. Uh, many of them, thousands of them, uh, to, that uh, some of them run up $20 million medical bills uh, over a lifetime uh, and lots of uh, anxiety and, uh, and harm to the, to the family members. When you get to that, then you will need to have a, a way of uh, ablating the, the endogenous uh, spermatogonial stem cells. Um, and replacing them with the new ones. I think ablation is relatively easy to do, uh, either surgically or chemically. Um, and many of these protocols have been developed already in animals. Uh, and so it's just a matter of perfecting those and, and testing them. Uh, and then there's the question of which is the, the more uh, clinically effective way of achieving change. So, for example, you don't want to have off-target and you don't want to have on-target. That's the wrong thing. Um, and so with, uh, with stem cells, you have the opportunity of doing clonal analysis where you'll do a number of different, uh, let's say, CRISPR modifications, for example, um, and different clones. And you'll take the sibling cells and analyze them and show that, indeed, it's exactly what you want. And then all the sibling cells uh, are likely to be um, the same. And so when you put it into a patient that's had their stem cells ablated, these stem cells will be 100% what you want. This is very different from most gene therapy, uh, let's say somatic gene therapy, where you might uh, treat uh, billions of cells. Uh, you get a mosaic, essentially. You get either a mosaic embryo or you get a mosaic adult, um, where each one is an independent CRISPR event, some of which are off target. Here, since it's clonal, you can, you can really uh, um, get assurance in advance that it's, uh, that it's the right thing. Right. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, approach. That uh, One of the other arguments that I think has sometimes been raised about uh, gene editing in embryos is that it might be used, be al although in single gene diseases, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is an effective way of selecting for embryos not affected by a disease, uh, gene editing might be an approach used by people who are trying to modify more complex polygenic traits, uh, which is not as amenable to uh, pre-implantation selection or prenatal selection, since it's very hard to get an embryo with, say, select an embryo with, say, eight different uh, 
uh, specific alleles, whereas that might be more easy to simply edit those, uh, introduce those changes in by directly editing. Uh, is that something you see coming down the road at all? That would be, I think, much more controversial and difficult to justify clinically, but well, it, it 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 could be justified clinically if the disease is severe enough. Uh, it, we will probably all these things will start with a pretty significant clinical indication. If it involves two genes, I, I can see how again with this clonal analysis, you could get it a perfect clone that uh, by clone I mean set clone of cells, of cell. cells, yeah, uh, where two genes are are changed back to the the population average to the very common alleles, and that, that would solve uh, that particular disease. Um, um, polygenic diseases are not necessarily solved by polygenic therapies. So, for example, uh, height is a polygenic and poly-environmental trait um, that is medically treated. Um, there are maybe a d dozen different diseases that have some component, and it's treated with a single gene product, which is uh, growth hormone, human growth hormone. Um, so sometimes a very complex, you know, involving thousands of different genes and many different environmental components, many of which are poorly understood, can have a single gene solution. So I think we need to be open-minded about, uh, you know, the practical, pragmatic way that medicine is practiced. Uh, um, where, where sometimes the solutions are much, easy, much easier than you might think from the complex science that's behind it. Sure, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so related to the questions about human gene editing, one of the, the big distinctions that's in the background in all these ethical discussions is the distinction between somatic gene therapy, where you're doing gene therapy on an adult patient on particular cells in their body, and so-called germline uh, gene editing, where you're either editing an embryo or you're editing the sperm cells or gametes in a way that a child will be born that has uh, their entire body affected by the edited genes and will then pass on those edited genes to subsequent generations. Um, what do you think about this uh, ethical distinction? Do you think there are, for instance, any serious risks from gene editing that might be apparent in subsequent generations, but not in the patient whose genes have been edited? which seems to be the implicit kind of concern raised by this distinction between somatic and germline, that subsequent generations may be at risk in ways that the actual patients are not. Uh, do, you think, do, you take, do you think these are serious concerns about, say, the loss of genetic diversity or the potential for future generations to have problems with certain gene therapies that were not apparent in the uh, initial patient? Well, I think we should take very seriously every every idea that comes up for um, cautionary uh, uh, measures. In fact, we need to encourage the population of all sorts uh, to, to weigh in on this and, and think creatively about uh, uh, un, unintended consequences. Uh, but you have, you have two, two uh, issues here on, on the table. The two issues are, um, you know, subs, uh, d downstream uh, impact uh, which I think is true for many different drugs. Uh, uh, you know, you can have cancer chemotherapy can affect your germline. Uh, nevertheless, it's considered the, the benefits outweigh the, the risks. Do you mind uh, if by affecting the germline in terms of like uh, the ablative effects of uh, chemotherapy or mutations, mutations or mutations? mutations? Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, you can imagine things like vaccines, uh, smallpox. We've eliminated smallpox from the entire planet. That could have had something that many generations later, or even polio for that matter, uh, many generations later, you find that, oh, well, you know, a little bit of smallpox was a good thing for the population. Um, you know, we found, so I, I think we, we have to take educated guesses. We do animal experiments. We do controlled clinical trials on humans, on small populations. Uh, but you can't always wait for two or three generations to see the outcome. I think with, with gene therapy, um, whether it's gene editing or other, um, what, what's going, we're going to start out with changing an allele back to the dominant allele in the, in the population. So, so it might be 0.1% of the population has a very rare um, deleterious allele, and we're going to change it to the one that's common and uh, um, 
and and healthful and already te already tested. So I think that those will be easier to to, to uh, and after many years of experience with that, you'll start seeing uh, a few creeping in that uh, that might have multi generational uh, impacts because we're changing them something other than the wild type, other than the common allele. But I don't think that will be the first round. And by that time, we'll have a great deal of confidence in the technology as as a whole. We'll just have to case by case be asking, well, is this something new that's never been tested before? That's that's going to be the key thing. Or is or is there? We will also will want to avoid off targets because those will be things that may not have been tested before. Sure, off target our off targets will in almost all cases be something you would want to have. Uh, well, there 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 are many off targets. I'm sure that are quite that are quite neutral. The main off targets you don't want are hitting the coding regions of tumor suppressor genes, which is like. A couple percent of a couple percent of your genome, and the off-target rate is you know less than one in ten thousand cells. So it, it it could be made vanishingly small, but but it's something that that where it's a little hard to predict uh, um, in a, in a germline what the consequences yeah. would be. Yeah, in germline, I think it might be uh, other off-target effects might also be problematic. Exactly. Um, exactly. In, in somatic cells, I think it really would just be tumor suppressor genes because yeah. that would be when the cell with a mutation would actually proliferate and cause a problem. But if you're editing an embryo, uh, any kind of off-target effect in a protein coding gene will affect that person's health because they won't have other cells. Um, right. Well, it, it, and that's something that might affect subsequent generations. So, mm -hmm. so if you just affect one allele, one of the two chromosomes, uh, that no, most genes, uh, are, are, uh, are not dominant most of the variations, but it but it could be uh, later if if you have two people that have that same off target that get married, then you could end up with a homozygote, and that's something that's an example of something that could show up in later generations. But presumably, long before that happened, you'd be aware of that off target, um, and you would be counseling them the same way you would counsel them about Tay Sachs or other recessive diseases that you know watch out. Here's a new allele that we don't that. Uh, that was created by uh, an off-target effect. Yeah, it'd just uh, be the introduction of new recessive you, disease you could, genes. Could, you might that might happen, and that would be something which would have this. We would treat the same way that we're treating uh, recessive diseases in general. Sure. Uh, to switch gears, maybe a little bit, uh, I'd like to talk a bit about um, some of the relationship between technology and basic science. Uh, which, I mean, you've been involved in a lot of very ambitious. Uh, and very successful technological projects over the past uh, couple decades, the human genome uh, uh, reading project, a lot of the gene editing technologies, and now gene writing. Uh, these have been technologies that have progressed uh, very, very quickly. Um, gene sequencing, for instance, has, as I think you mentioned earlier, become much faster, much more reliable, much cheaper over the past, since, since the beginning of the human genome project. Uh, on the other hand, there have also been <clears throat> Uh, in a lot of other areas of biomedicine, a lot less success. Uh, if you look at, um, you, I think you might have mentioned Moore's Law, or in some other talks you've mentioned Moore's Law, comparing that to genome sequencing, how uh, genome sequencing progresses much faster than the computer processing power that Moore's Law describes. But in terms of, say, the pharmaceutical industry, people talk about um, uh, Eroom's Law, the opposite of Moore's Law, where the cost and time it takes to produce new successful drugs and get them to market has actually been increasing over time. It's actually been kind of a bad process. It's been slowing down and stagnating. Uh, so what do you think about this kind of relationship? Some people say that there's even sort of crises in science, how, you know, we can't replicate results anymore. Uh, there's fraud and misconduct and all kinds of problems with retracting major influential papers from biomedical science journals. Uh, do you think that, how, how do you think this sort of tension resolves between, the, on the one hand, the great success of gene sequencing and many of these other technologies with this apparent stagnation in the broader biomedical science enterprise? Well, I, uh, I hope, but I can't prove that the, that the, that the subsets that you're going exponentially um, can reverse some of the stagnation. Uh, they haven't really had a chance yet, so uh, we'll have to wait and see. But, but I think that you know, when you bring down the cost of reading and writing, uh, 
say, more than a million fold, that could have an impact both on reproducibility because you can now collect all. It's not just reading the, the genome, it's transcriptome, proteome, uh, you know, all kinds of microbiome, immunome. And these can be ancillary parts of the experiment that can uh, address uh, reproducibility. Many of the problems of reproducibility, I don't think it's really increased so much as as it's uh, it's, ve it's the very expensive experiments that involve lots of animal trials uh, or, or human clinical trials where it's very hard to reproduce it. It's hard to get a big enough cohort or animal cohort size uh, to get really good statistics. And so they tend to be, uh, and there's also a, a, a publication bias, they tend to publish the ones with the most remarkable and positive results. Um, and I think that's changing uh, for not just the technological reasons that I mentioned, but also for sociological reasons, we're becoming much more transparent. We're requiring uh, negative results be and enabling negative results on big studies to be published. Um, so I, I think that that will will help uh, tremendously. I think the the progress in synthetic biology uh, and precision medicine will uh, reduce. Um, it will reduce failures in, in part, but it will also uh, um, uh, enable more creative, uh, transformative approaches. So a lot of the failures come from when a patent is running out on a drug and uh, a company wants to just add a, a methyl or acetyl group somewhere on the drug to extend the patent lifetime. It's not surprising that now the control is not placebo control, but it's the best practices, which is the previous drug. It's not surprising that that particular study uh, being so incremental uh, and, and to some extent arbitrary doesn't succeed. But if we start getting transformative new kinds of technology rather than replacing small molecules with, with uh, cell therapies and gene therapies, um, we might find a whole new uh, breath of fresh air and a whole new cost curve. So I, I hope that's not sounding too optimistic, but it's, it's based on my personal experience with these exponentials. Yeah, we, we can we can hope so. It is um, it is still a little bit troubling that because there's been really a fairly long history of the exponential growth in these technologies that's sort of gone along with this long history of the sort of decline of productivity in the pharmaceutical industry and so forth. But I, it's hopefully that as these technologies sort of get to a tipping point, maybe there will be a reversal there. Yeah. I mean, the, the really, the, the progress in sequencing and synthesis has been mostly since 2007. Uh, and it really hasn't had that much time to impact uh, clinical trials and animal trials, for that matter, either. So uh, a slightly more specific question related to this kind of relationship between basic science and technology that you've been quite uh, involved in and familiar with is the history of CRISPR, this new gene editing technology. Uh, one of There's been obviously a lot of, um, or maybe not everybody knows about this, but there's been uh, quite a few patent disputes and conflicts over who would get credit for this. Um, rather than talking about that, though, I'd be interested in talking about this narrative about the history of CRISPR, which is this gene editing technology that, to some extent at least, uh, emerged from uh, basic science about microbiology. CRISPR was a immune system in bacteria that was used by the bacteria to destroy invading viruses and things like this. Uh, and it was realized by some microbiologists that this might have gene editing applications. And there's this narrative that this is an example of a kind of serendipitous discovery of curiosity-driven research that resulted in a really useful technology. Uh, to what extent do you, in your experience of uh, working with CRISPR in its early stages, uh, is that is that narrative accurate, or is there was there more kind of really goal-driven, engineering-minded sort of approaches of really trying to develop this tool? Yeah, I think this is a nice example of, of both. Uh, I I, uh, I think the the serendipitous part is typically overstated. We tend to we tend to like discoveries and serendipity. We like to believe in the lottery winner rather than in the goal-oriented engineer. Uh, I personally kind of like the goal-oriented engineer. <laughs> you know, the idea that you build a house by throwing bricks up in the air uh, or, or that you uh, engineer a new agricultural species by 
random Darwinian um, mutation and selection. That said, so with with with, uh, with let's talk about genome engineering more broadly. There are about nine or ten different ways of doing it. Uh, um, right, CRISPR gets a lot of attention, but there are other technologies CRISPR as well. CRISPR gets uh, disproportionate attention in part because Oliver Smithies and Mario Capecci got the Nobel Prize for for a method that worked pretty well in 1985. Uh, there's almost every way that you can cut DNA specifically, uh, whether it's meganucleases or adapting DNA that just binds specifically, uh, proteins that bind DNA specifically, like zinc fingers or talons, adding a nuclease domain to those. Uh, there's uh, argonaut, there's, uh, the list goes on. Every time you see a nuclease, immediately it's sort of totally, totally obvious to everybody that's been in this field. A nuclease is an enzyme that cuts DNA cuts, at a yeah, particular place. Makes, makes a double strand break. Every time you hear of a new nuclease, then it's obvious that that is a candidate, but it doesn't guarantee that, that the next steps are obvious. In particular, for CRISPR, the non-obvious part uh, was how do you make the guide RNA so that it works well in mammalian cells. And it turned out that you needed to have two things right, um, and most of the groups didn't get that didn't get that right. Uh, you know, Prashant Mali happened to get it right, and then everybody uh, transitioned to that. But the basic idea of cutting is 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 totally obvious. Um, but you need the serendipity to keep giving us a steady stream of these things, just like CRISPR replaced talons, which replaces. ZFNs, which replaced meganucleases, there will be something that replaces CRISPR, and there's plenty of room for improvement. It's not 100% uh, efficient. It's got a lot of off-target and on-target problems, um, and we can look for things like recombinases um, and integrases as a new category that, that that could displace it. So, and 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 some of that will be serendipitous, but in the end, to turn it actually turn it into a technology that you can use in medicine and agriculture, uh, gene drives to eliminate mosquito-borne uh, diseases. All of those things require high degrees of creativity and en engineering know-how. And, and I think for the most part, the patent disputes are, are minor. I mean, they're, they're, they're little economic uh, tempests in a teapot. They don't, they don't really impact day-to-day -day research. They don't really impact the industry. Uh, they're just... They're just uh, you know, they're kind of like scandals in politics. They attract news cycles more than the real things that are impacting the field. Uh, I think there's very little question that there are multiple inventors involved in this technology. And so look, and going forward for the next phases of sort of genome engineering and more broadly, you would say that there's a sort of need for some of this curiosity-driven research and finding things from bacteria and other sources in nature that will be used as sort of candidates but there's still a lot of need for a kind of engineering mindset and goal-driven work at solving these problems. Absolutely. I mean, for example, one of the most promising ones that might replace CRISPR is called the Lambda Beta Recombinase, which instead of CRISPR, which requires two RNA, two, two nucleic acids to make a, an edit, it requires a guide RNA to find the location and a donor DNA to fix it. Um, the Beta Recombinase only requires one uh, nucleic acid, one single strand of DNA, and uh, and that was something where the serendipitous approach gave us, uh, you know, didn't actually deliver a technology yet that works in in mammalian cells, and so we and others are still working on that to uh, to make it work. Uh, so you can you could say that oh yeah, here's a serendipitous discovery, but in the case of beta recombinase, we've been working on it for over a uh, decade and a half without uh, working in mammalian cells. So there's a lot of engineering behind some of these technologies. Great. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to take a lot more work, I'm sure. Um, do you have any uh, other things that you'd like to talk about? I think that was most of the questions, really, that I uh, wanted to get to. Uh, I think you've covered quite a bit of territory there. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure, then. Um, thank you, Dr. Church, for, for taking the time to talk to me. This has been a very informative uh, discussion, I think. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah.